So reaction is coming in from politicians here in the United States, both Republicans and Democrats, also the U.S. president. Donald Trump took to Twitter Saturday to condemn the attack. He said the shooting was not only tragic, it was an act of cowardice. He added, there are no reasons or excuses that will ever justify killing innocent people. But presidential candidate and El Paso native Beto O'Rourke called out Mr. Trump after the shooting. O'Rourke suggested the president's rhetoric against minorities may have played a role in this attack. Listen. Yes, we've had a rise in hate crimes every single one of the last three years. During an administration where you have a president who's called Mexicans rapists and criminals, though Mexican immigrants commit crimes at a far lower rate than those born here in the country. He has tried to make us afraid of them to, to some real effect and, and consequence. Uh, attempting to ban all Muslims from this country, the day that he signed that executive order, the mosque in Victoria, Texas, was burned to the ground. Those chants that we heard in Greenville, North Carolina, send her back, talking about our fellow American citizens duly elected to represent their constituents in the Congress, who happen to be women of color he is a racist, and he stokes racism in this country. And it does not just offend our sensibilities. It, it fundamentally changes the character of this country, and it leads to violence. Um, and again, there, there are still details that we are waiting on. But I'm, I'm just following the lead that I've, that I've heard from the El Paso Police Department, where they say there are strong indications that um, this shooter uh, wrote that manifesto and that this was inspired by his hatred of people here in this community. Now, police are still investigating to determine whether the suspect wrote the manifesto that O'Rourke mentioned, but let's talk about all of this now with Brian Levin. Brian, the director of the Center for uh, Study of Hate and Extremism, joining this hour from Los Angeles. Brian, thank you for your time today. Uh, look, George, as always, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we appreciate you, you being with us to give us some, some insight on this. Uh, some strong words, obviously, from the Democratic presidential candidate Beto O'Rourke. Keeping in mind, El Paso is his hometown. What are your thoughts about how rhetoric might play into this hate and extremism that we're seeing? That is a great question. We just came out this week with a report where we said uh, white supremacist uh, extremism is the most descendant in a, in a very um, diverse uh, threat matrix. But with respect to your specific question, we've done uh, some interesting research with West Virginia University, and what we found is, is that, for instance, after the Muslim ban proposal came out five days after the San Bernardino terrorist attack, hate crimes against Muslims were already 300% above the average daily for the first 11 months of the year. Then, after the Muslim ban proposal, it went up to over 400%, a 23% increase. November 2016, election month, worst month for hate crime in 14 years, and the day after election day, which included uh, a bomb plot against a predominantly Muslim apartment complex, was the worst day since June 2003, and last, uh, around last year, election time, our uh, specific research that we did at the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism uh, found a spike in many cities outside of the southernmost portion of the United States. So when we do day-by-day -day ticks, we've seen that this has happened. Interestingly enough, just give me one second. When uh, candidate Trump launched his campaign in a very tightly packed news week, um, Hate crimes against Latinos did not go up, but going back to November 2016, that was the group that had the biggest increase during that month. Hmm. I want to talk about the alleged gunman now. Uh, he gave up uh, without a shot fired. Given your understanding of who would do this type of thing and why someone would do this type of disgusting thing, what do you think was behind that? I think... I I think it's chilling that it matches exactly what we wrote on page three of our study, which just came out at the end of July. And, and what I talked about it in, in the study was how uh, these kinds of extremists, and, and, and it's our belief that this is an act of domestic terrorism, uh, white supremacists. And again, we're going to wait, this is a suspected, we're saying suspected, until the authorities uh, officially call it that. But if, if one reads the alleged manifesto, which I have, um, 
it, it, it references uh, prior acts and it references a book and a doctrine that is popular among white supremacists. And what we're seeing is a vertical integration. And what I mean is these folks are now referencing prior killers and prior uh, writings, and they're trying to inscribe their own in another chapter of this racist Bible of evil, which is taking place on the internet. It's, it's a newer trend that we've been seeing, but it, it's scary and it's something we've seen with uh, young males from about 19 to 21. And what they do is they're angry, they're frustrated, they're cleaving away from their families, they've left school. And what happens is these uh, fears, grievances, and frustrations are then amplified, sculpted, and directed to who is regarded the legitimate targets of aggression within these subcultures. And in this particular subculture, it's about how whites are being overrun by people of color. And with him in particular, he was talking about Latinos. But he referenced texts that were talking about Europe being overrun by Muslims. But in his particular world, it's going to be Latinos. And, and, and just one quick thing. You would reference about political rhetoric. When the Tree of Life massacre, which took place back in October, it was also around a, a contentious uh, political season and Jews were targeted but they were targeted because they wanted to help Latino immigrants according to that assailant. Hmm. I want to delve in just a bit uh, on these online chat boards. No need to mention the, the name of the chat board. People can Thank you. Google it and figure it out. But um, the gunman allegedly posted his reasoning, his twisted reasoning on this board. It is a place that is rife with racist and anti-Semitic Conspiracy theories, is there anything more that can be done to monitor, to police these sites? Keeping in mind it was just a short amount of time uh, when he posted uh, the post on that site and apparently the, uh, the attack, uh, you know, took place. Allegedly yes, posted is... that attack, uh, posted the, uh, the message, I should say. Yes, and we are waiting for official confirmation. But if, if, if we look at some of the, the, the past instances, uh, these folks have posted on what I'm going to call these fragmented affinity-based platforms. So what has happened is there's been a migration, and this is in our study too. Go to Prof. Levin, you'll see the study on Twitter. Um, what, we, what we're seeing is that they're getting radicalized on the web, but they're also trying to make their mark on the web. And we have three types of, of these kind of offenders ideologically motivated, psychologically dangerous, or personal benefit or, or revenge, and they, you can mix and match, but one is usually predominant. And what I think, unfortunately, is that uh, we have more ticking time bombs in the United States. Uh, white supremacist extremism has supplanted violent Salafist jihadists over the last few years, and unfortunately, as we wrote in our report, chillingly, uh, unfortunately, we expect this to continue. Uh, social media companies, I think, need to do a better job, but what's already happened is there's been a migration to these kinds of platforms which you discussed, these splintered, flag, uh, fragmented, affinity-based platforms, and they're not cats playing the piano. We're talking about vicious, vicious bigotry as expressed allegedly by this particular assailant. And, you know, given that this is a, a developing story, and I want to just be very clear since I misspoke just a moment ago, in, uh, investigators are still looking into uh, determining whether uh, this alleged gunman uh, posted this on that site that doesn't, uh, you know, deserve mentioning. We will, of course, continue to bring you the updates as we get it. But, Brian, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, as always. Well, let's get some insight now from the scene from CNN law enforcement analyst Josh Campbell. He's a former FBI supervisory special agent. Josh spoke earlier with CNN's Alex Marquardt about the attack. Let's listen. Law enforcement official familiar with the ongoing investigation tells us that the Bureau has opened uh, what they're calling a domestic terrorism investigation that will run concurrently to the state investigation. Now, they're stressing that the state is still in charge here. The state of Texas investigators have the lead, but the FBI has opened a concurrent case to look into the possible motivation of the shooter to include ideology. Uh, if there's any type of hate crime angle to this, they'll be working that case, especially looking into this alleged manifesto that we've been talking about. Again, trying to get into the mindset of the shooter. Was this someone who came here causing 
mass loss of life based on hate. And obviously the FBI, the federal government, has a host of resources that they can bring to bear. I was just in California last week. We were covering yet another mass shooting. In that instance, the FBI also providing resources. They provided their profilers uh, from the behavioral analysis unit at Quantico that helped them get into the mindset of this person based on these past incidents. So we can bet that there will be a host of resources that the federal government will be bringing to bear. We're told that there are different offices, satellite offices around Texas that are sending resources here and FBI assets at headquarters in Washington are standing by uh, to deploy to this location should they get any requests from state officials here that are leading the investigation. It is a tragedy that played out in El Paso, Texas, though my home state, a good state with, you know, many, many people, diverse people, people coming together in times of tragedy. And we're seeing that play out right now, uh, just as what we saw in El Paso Saturday. We uh, saw long lines, people coming together to donate blood, given this terrible attack that happened. We'll have more on that as Newsroom continues. Stay with us.